So by market-based uh, policy, I primarily refer to uh, congestion pricing. Um, so uh, I will briefly discuss the equity concern of congestion pricing uh, and then present a modeling framework and how we actually optimize pricing scheme with explicit consideration of equity. And then I will discuss another market-based instrument, which is uh, implementation of cap and trade concept uh, in congestion to address uh, equity concerns. And then I'll conclude uh, my talk with a few remarks. Okay, so congestion pricing uh, is really a century old concept. Uh, it was first systematically discussed by Pigou uh, in his seminal work of um, the economic of, uh, welfare. Um, so Pigou argued that uh, congestion really is a market failure um, because we don't why we have congestion is because driving is underpriced. So driving, driving imposes um, negative externality on society, uh, but drivers do not pay for that externality. So then the way, like any regular products, if the product is underpriced, that leads to overconsumption. So similarly, if driving is underpriced, that leads to overconsumption of driving, which leads to congestions. So then a way of correct that will be charge toll to internalize the externality. Okay? So that's the economic interpretation or explanation of congestion pricing. But uh, this interpretation explanation does not necessarily resonate well, uh, resonate well with uh, uh, engineers and, and the general public. So a simpler way of introducing the idea is, OK. Congestion in 1920? What's that? Where, where was there congestion? <laughs> <laughs> or, or is it congestion? And, and it's, uh, you can foresee uh, in the beginning, you see the rise of the congestion, right? <laughs> no, no, when, when Green Shields did his, his measurements, right? The seven measurements, that was like 15 years later. Well, that's, there, no, there, 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 30, 30 years. 10 years later. 1935. Right, exactly, yeah, 15 years later, right? Right, 15 so, years so, later. So there he had a hard time finding congested traffic. Well, he had to go to a different location to get an extra data point in congestion. But at least at that time, you yeah. can observe it is some that, the, the example he used, the two routes, Okay, but sort it quick this out they, and you they, can see congestion. They had horse drawn carriages. Exactly. That's what I'm asking, yeah. exactly. So, is yeah. it for cars or is it for other modes of transportation as well? Is the idea older than, than car traffic? Oh, yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, I see. Yes. Okay, yes. okay. Yes. okay. Yes. Yes. Also, you need to take into account the people who are working in here. Yes. When I say driving, I use it. <laughs> yes. Okay, okay, good. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, for engineer, uh, um, engineer typically I say, hey, congestion pricing is your toll to incentivize travelers to change their travel choices to reduce congestion, enhance system performance, and improve social welfare. Okay, so that's how I explain to them. Um, and then this is a market-based instrument because as compared with the command and control policy, like driving ban and driving restrictions. Okay, so a lot of, uh, if you look at literature, um, most of the transportation economists uh, and many planner engineers believe that congestion pricing is a good idea. Um, and, and so, and also we have a uh, very successful implementation in Singapore, London, Stockholm, and Milan. So those evidence actually support that, okay? Um, so when properly designed, congestion pricing actually function as intended and achieving, improving social welfare, reducing congestions, right? However, and congestion pricing remain a very tough sell to the public. Um, so the, much of those public opposition center on equity, so perceived inequality. Um, so they argue that congestion pricing harm the poor more than the rich. Um, and the poor, because they have inflexible schedules, so therefore they have to pay the toll, or they will be priced off. They have to force to switch to less desirable route, departure time, and travel modes. Okay, that's the argument. Um, and you can see that this, this argument actually win the debate a lot of time a good proposal actually uh, were abandoned. So we saw this happening in Hong Kong, in um, um, Cambridge, UK, and previously in New York City. Okay, so give you one example. Um, right after the implementation, successful implementation of congestion pricing in U uh, London, so UK actually in 2007 had a proposal for national road pricing. Okay, that's in 2007. And then when that proposal was announced, someone filed a petition on the official uh, website of the prime minister. And that petition, very short period of time, get 1.8 million signatures. So the petition says, 
Um, it will be an unfair tax on those who live apart from families and poor people who will not be able to afford the high monthly cost. Once again, it's a perceived inequality argument. And so, because so many people, it's roughly like maybe 5% of the population actually signed up this, this petition. So at that time, uh, I think Tony Blair was the prime minister and he had to respond, eventually cancel that proposal. Okay, so um, a lot of those concerns, equity concerns actually are legit, are reasonable. Um, and so the problem is how we address that. And so there is a report um, issued in 2008 by Federal Highway Administrations. And the report says the equity concern can be largely addressed by a well-designed pricing scheme that charge the right amount of toll at the right locations and redistribute the toll revenue wisely. Okay? So it's certainly easily said than done. So uh, what do we, we need a modeling framework um, to really to know what's the right price at the right location and how to use that revenue wisely. Okay, so I'm gonna present this modeling framework. This actually is partially address the challenges that Carl mentioned, okay, can we have a modeling framework to support that decision making. Um, so the modeling framework should capture the distributional effect of pricing scheme, um, different income, different individual and group, so thereby facilitating meaningful discussion on equity, okay? So we know that the equity really about whether this distribution is appropriate or not, right? Because there's so many principles, so many definitions, and so many ways of categorizing individual and, 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 and groups. So we need a working definition. So in presenting my framework, this is the working definition I use. It's talk about income-based equity, okay? Um, so because that's the primary concern um, we just discussed. So the really is about the distribution of the impact between individual and group that differ in income. So that's a, so therefore a, a pricing scheme is deemed to be more equitable if it leads to a more uniform distribution of wealth across populations, okay? So that's my definition, income-based equity. So you can group those people spatially, have a different way of group people, that's fine. The modern framework can accommodate that. But at this moment, let's just use this working definition, income-based equity, a more equitable pricing scheme will lead to a more uniform distribution of wealth across populations, okay? So um, let's look at the modeling framework. So the basic consideration, we're gonna look at a general um, multi-model network, so with general topology. And then we're gonna consider three types of facility, transit, highway. For highway, we could differentiate regular lanes and where uniform pricing has, can be applied. Or you have a high occupancy toll lanes where you can differentiate high occupancy vehicle and single occupancy vehicles. We can charge them differently, okay? Um, so then we consider for each OD pair, the number of traveler is fixed, but they choose, they're different in different income, they have different preference, but they choose among one of the four modes, no travel, chance transit, drive along, and couple, okay? So essentially we consider no travel as one of the options, so therefore we consider a elastic demand, travel demand, okay? So they can choose not to travel. Um, so now let's assume we have a pricing scheme. By pricing scheme here I refer that you can charge on regular highway, uh, you can charge different price for uh, single occupancy vehicle and, and high occupancy vehicles at uh, hot lengths. You can make adjustment of fare for transit. Okay, adjustment can be positive, can be negative. Negative mean, mean that you subsidize transit. Okay, this is pricing scheme. Um, so then, let's assume we have such a pricing scheme. We want to model the resulting, uh, the total network equilibrium. Uh, I also capture its distribution effect. Okay, here because the transit is flow dependent, the transit travel time is flow dependent, the, uh, the uh, link travel time, highway travel time is flow dependent. So therefore, we look at uh, network equilibrium. So uh, we use um, nested energy model to model the mode choice and rule choice. Okay, this is standard definition 
a multinomial uh, nesting logic model. And then when we specify the utility function for a specific, specific route under a specific mode for a specific user group, um, and you're going to specify the utility functions. And typically, uh, you specify the utility function. It's, it's a simple uh, specification. Okay? So the base knot is the constant. It's going to be a uh, mode and, and group specific constant. Beta 1 times this is the travel time. Sorry. This is the travel time. And then you have the income for the group minus the total. Okay, so this is the typical uh, specification that we saw in the literature. Um, this is essentially the linear income. So this type of this this essentially assumes that you have constant utility, marginal utility of income, and which will actually um, it's pointed out in the literature. It leads to underestimate of the regressiveness of a pricing scheme, because when you assume the Income, marginal utility income is constant, which means that a dollar brings the same level of satisfaction for a people regardless of their income level. Okay? So typically, the marginal utility of income should decrease with respect to income. A dollar means more to a low-income people than high-income people. Right? So therefore, when you impose a toll, the burden of that toll will be higher for the low-income individuals than high-income individuals. So we need to consider that income effect. So therefore, um, you, we have to, if you want to consider such income effect, you really have to use nonlinear utility functions. And this is some of the standard specification in economics. Okay? So you capture, um, it, the function is, um, because this is really the indirect utility function, right? So we specify. Um, the, the utility function, the indirect utility function is a function of the attributes of the options and also the income level. Okay, indirect utility function. And then you, this is, this is nonlinear, you can nonlinear function of the attributes, and you also capture some interaction between different attributes and tools. Okay, so um, once you have this, um, so now we are assuming, once you specify the, the, this non utility function, you assume everyone. Uh, follow the you can use nesting logic model to make choice of mode and route because the flow the travel time are flow dependent okay so you look at the steady state of the network for the steady state we have the the multimodal network use the equilibrium where the perceived utility of each traveler is maximized okay that's steady state of that network um, and then you can formulate that uh, steady state as equivalent uh, variational inequality. You solve this variational inequality, you can estimate the flow distribution and real life demand. Okay? So that's how you prescribe that equilibrium conditions, uh, equilibrium flow and, and travel time and, 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 and demand. So now, let's look at how you model the impact on individual level, this individual social welfare. Um, so we use equivalent income as the individual welfare measure. Um, this is essentially a measure of how wealthy a, a traveler feels after pricing. Okay? Um, so definition is, is an income level that allows the individual to experience under the no toll scenarios the same level of utility as the original income does in the pricing scenarios. Okay? The definition is like this. So you have the original income, and you impose a toll. So this is going to be the corresponding utility. And then you look at a no tolling scenario, and you look for a income level, and such that this utility matches this utility. And this is going to be the equivalent income. Jeff, I have a question, because uh, uh, why do you need to take this step? Because the, the, the non-linear utility functions right. are supposed to capture that. What would explain why you need that? But you need the, the uh, measure, the change of the utility. And, and then you, because remember, the change of utility, and then you want to get a dollar amount of that change. Right? You want to measure the satisfaction using money. 
That's the answer to your question. So, so how you measure satisfaction, how you measure happiness, in this situation, you use utility. But then when you, change, you want to change, OK, how I measure the change of utility, you use money. So this equivalent income, essentially, is a, a measure of the change in utility. So you, you convert into the dollar amount. OK? So uh, to give you, to elaborate, so you have a original income. And then for no tool scenario, you have this toll. When I impose a tolling scheme, suppose that your utility reduced. And now I look for, I'm going to adjust this income such that this utility matches this utility. OK? So this is going to be my equivalent income. This is my original income. And because the pricing reduces your utility, and your equivalent income will be less than the original income. So the difference between the equivalent income and original income is called as equivalent variations. So that's a measure of the change in utility. Right? So it's really a standard definition in economics. Um, so Sorry, I'm, I'm a little unsure just for clarification. So in order to be able to do this, do you need to charge people from different income classes different tolls? So it doesn't matter. You can uniform toll. This is whatever toll you give to me. Okay. And you make choices. Your choice, your choice could be different from previous one. So let's say I make one toll that's independent of the people's income. Right. And then I'm going to measure what's the impact on people with different income. And basically, but how could there be any scenario that it is not regressive? Because you brought this before. I, I don't see that. How, if, if I make the toll independent of the income, uh -huh. in, under what, how could it become... Not regressive. I'll give you an example. OK, good. You will. Okay. Oh, <laughs> no, no, I'll give you an example. Simple okay, example. Yes, yeah. So this is, a, this is a 1OD pair, right? Right. This is high income people live. This is low income people live. Yeah. So I charge people. Uh, there's one link connecting from here, another link connect here, right? right? I charge toll here. I do not charge toll here. And low income people travel from here, and the high income travel from here. Okay. So then this is a progressive. So, so you charge high when most of the rich people are traveling right. that route? Right, because it's, it's a spatial problem, and yeah. the rich people live somewhere. <laughs> Low-income people rich live somewhere. I kind of ch I, even this uniform tolling, I see. there's so, different implications. So you make it progressive on average in some sense, right? No, I, so I live... It's not by construction, right? It's just because I happen to be part of those kind of people who are rich, right? I, I pay more. So you give me the information yeah. about where they live, the income okay. groups, and then I can, I can optimize, and then I can right. show you the distributional impact. Right. And then I can show you whether it's progressive or regressive. I can show yeah, you that. Yeah. So, but if you know on average a lot of rich people travel here, then you just charge more because on this side more rich people Correct. travel. Correct. So right. that's because it's, even I do not do differential pricing, yeah. there's different implication. How online. could that be sold to anybody? That seems like... <laughs> okay. I mean, okay, you're, you're doing the mathematical concept. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay, good. Then basically, I should state that now changes in the income provides a basis for subsidies. What's that? Let's say, with the intent of the calculation of the equivalent income right. is to have the basis for subsidies. No, this is the, the, the reason why I want to do equivalent income because I want to capture the social wealth on individual, right? Individual wear, awareness, whether they change or not. Because if pricing reduces your utility, I want to put a down amount on that impact. Right. So this is a, when, you, when the pricing reduces your utility, your equivalent income will be less than the original income. But if the price increases your utility, and when you compute this, your equivalent income will be higher than your original income. Really, this equivalent income measures how wealthy an individual feel after pricing. OK? So we're going to compute that. So now, one, this is really the standard definition in economics, equivalent variation and equivalent income. But a caveat is, if you use random utility theory, this is random. This is random. So therefore, the utility, the, um, the, um, um, the equivalent income is also random. OK? So imagine you have two options, option A, option B. So you have, before pricing, there's a probability for you to choose option A, option B. If I impose pricing, your choice outcome will be different. A different set of probability for you to choose option A, option B. Then I can do different combination, A, 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 B, B, A, and B, B. 
There are different probabilities for each combination, combination to happen. But for each combination, A and B, it's easy for you to calculate that equivalent income. I go through all the combination, I can compute the expectation. Okay, we'll compute the expectation. But that's really tedious. If imagine you're computing a expected equivalent income for a large group of users that are facing a number of options. The computation is very demanding because it's combinatorial in nature. But there's a formula proposed by uh, Dexwick and Kallstrom in 2005. And so they proposed this formulation, and this formulation allows us to calculate this ex expectation without going through all the, without knowing this actual outcome. But this, you have to do numerical integration. You have to do integration to compute that expectation. Okay? But you can compute it. So once you compute it for different groups, and then I will have a social welfare. My social welfare will be, now I know individual um, expected equivalent income. I sum them up. That can be my user benefit. Most precisely, if you want to use user benefit, there will be total expected equivalent variations. Okay? Um, and then I, the government gets some total revenue that will be producer's benefit. So the social welfare, the efficiency measure will be the summation of this expected income and also the total revenue. I would do, because I have the, essentially the distribution of the utility, I have a distribution of the equivalent income, I'll be able to compute equity measures. So here, similar to Honey, we use um, Gini coefficient, okay? Um, you can use many other measures because I have a distribution. You can do min max, you can do max min. You can use the nice social welfare function that John proposed as an objective function, right? So now, um, and as John mentioned, the unit are different. We normalize them. We normalize them by, we divide by no total scenario for the social benefit. And then for Gini coefficient, uh, we normalize by no total. <coughs> and we do the convex combinations. Once again, um, this is just one example. The framework is general. You can use the social wealth function that John proposed and add objective function. Okay? And then subject to the VI constraint for the equilibrium. And then the equilibrium flow distribution should be feasible. And this is the design. And for the, um, for the, we only require the highway tolling is positive and the transits Adjustment can be negative. You do, okay, a subsidy. Essentially, the revenue redistribution is part of these decisions. Okay? And then for the regular lengths, is uniform tolling, and if no travel, no tolling. And here we also require the net revenue is non negative because you collect revenue, you use to subsidize transit, you want the net revenue to be non negative. Okay? So this is just pricing. Once again, I said this is a pretty general framework. If you use the money to improve the transit frequency, if you want to add a transit line, and you can do that because essentially the transit assignment part is a frequency strategy-based, frequency-based assignment problem. Okay, you can adjust the frequency, you can adjust the transit fare, you can add a transit line. It's all included in this mathematical framework. Um, and also, if you incorporate destination choice, when you specify the utility function, if you use, in that utility function, you include the number of jobs in that origin, in that destination, then this equivalent income actually captures the impact. So the equivalent variation actually is a measure of accessibility. It's actually argued by, because some people argue that log sum can be used as the accessibility. This is essentially more general than log sum because equivalent variation is a, is a general, uh, because you nest in logic model, you can use equivalent variation as a measure of the accessibility. And then you can maximize that. You can use mean, uh, minimum, max mean. So this is really a, a general framework that allow you to incorporate different type of decision, incorporate different thinking of principle or equity. Okay, because I have a way to measure the impact of an investment, a policy, on the individual welfare. Then we can incorporate different type of idea and principle 
in this modeling framework. So now, um, but the problem really is a mathematical program is a MPEG problem uh, with equilibrium constraints. It's really difficult to solve um, um, because it's a non-convex problem, and also the constraint qualification is now satisfied. The KKD condition does not necessarily hold. Um, and the component difficulty is we have to compute. We have to do numerical integration to compute the expected equivalent income. So that's why um, when we did the empirical study, we have to, to use a derivative-free method. Okay, we tried different type of method, and the campus search, a, a particular pattern search method, actually performed well in our numerical example. Okay, we didn't try very hard because this is um, the focus was developing that framework, um, and I believe that we can do better in terms of proposing better solution algorithm. Okay, so then. Um, Let's look at the numerical example. Uh, so this is a numerical example we did roughly 15 years ago. So therefore, at that time, we, <laughs> we were looking for a realistic network. Um, and uh, Steve Boyle from UT Austin, he just graduated in his dissertation, there's <laughs> this particular network. So we use this network. He had the ODD man, and we try our best to calibrate. Uh, because uh, Franklin did a nice study in these areas, and he has the um, utility function calibrated, so we use his result. Um, and also, we divide the, the, um, the whole region into four income groups, on average 20K, 40K, 70K, 120K. So this is, a, we did like 15 years ago, so the income level should be much higher, okay? And also, you can classify into more groups uh, because the, the size of, we control the size of the problem, and we didn't try very hard to solve a large scale problem, but you can definitely do more income groups, okay? So now let's look at results. And this is uh, the, um, we changed the, uh, this combat combination of the efficiency and equity. We changed the, um, the alpha and then by, and give you different policy. This is a non-dominating um, solution, Pareto optimum solution. This is the Pareto, Pareto optimum frontier, right? Um, but one observation is, no matter how hard we try, the no-toe scenario is the most equitable one. For that network, if you want to improve efficiency, you really have to compromise income-based equity, okay, for that network, for if you use the tolling, uniform tolling. And if you look at the distributional effect. Sorry, how is net benefit measured? What's that? The, the horizontal axis, net benefit. Right, that's essentially what I mentioned, is uh, the total, the summation that's of That's only the, the money you make from that policy, it's not the secondary. No, 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 the social welfare. It's a revenue plus the total summation, total sum of the equivalent income. Yeah. Yeah. But that's, but. That's a social welfare. If you're pricing, you might also reduce the total amount of delay, right? That people yeah, it's part of, part of the calculation. Oh, that's also factored in. Yeah, because, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, because remember the travel time, when you do the utility function, the travel time is part of the utility function. Right, if you reduce the travel time, your utility is gonna increase. Ah, okay, okay. Everything's captured. But the supply induced demand is not captured, right? It's assumed you have a fixed amount of trips that people take. No, 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 no. The number of the travel is fixed. Right. But then you can choose not to travel. Oh, I see, okay, okay. Yeah, so the demand is, is elastic. Okay, and then, and then the extra trip that is taken creates an extra economic value as well? What's that? If people take an extra trip, right, if it's not just a silly trip, it usually creates an extra economic value as well. Right, so because you, cap you have a demand function, essentially, right. so you capture the, the, the benefit that it gets from traveling. Oh, that's also modeled in there. Yeah, it's modeled. Okay, so there's parameters in there. Yes, yes. This. Okay, got it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Carol? Do you include trips that previously were not taken by car, or is it only taking the... We, ju we just assume that the fixed demand, fixed number of traveler from origin destination, and then people actually choose, if you do a pricing, and people actually can decide to drive, and can decide to take a transit, is really the outcome of the model. So I do not make any assumptions. Does the model tell you that previously they, they were driving, now they switch to transit. Previously they do not travel, now they travel. We, right, we include the, the, this, when we did this, 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 this population, yes, yes. Yes. When people do carpool, how does this toe be split? That's, we, in, this, in this one, I did, we didn't do carpool. We didn't do carpool. 
Yeah, we model, we have it, but numeric sample, we didn't have a couple, right? But if you say when you, um, if you have a carpool, you, how you calculate that, right? So it depends on, you can do, I guess, a uniform distribution between uh, split among the passenger and driver, then you can calculate that, right? But I, in this numeric example, we didn't do. Can you remind us what are the core policies in the, in the diagram? What's that? Can you remind us what are the four policies in the next uh, slide? Oh, it's just, um, the policy is just the tolling on the highway and fair adjustment for transit. Okay, so the, the highway, so here, I assume that those are the highway links and there's a parallel transit link. And then my decision is how much I toll for each link. Okay, I'll give you an example. This is my decision. For each link, this is the, this is the, this is the toll, and this is the adjustment of the transit fare. Okay? So this is my results. So these are not the, uh, the results of your optimization? These are no, this is result optimization. Okay, but how, why did you get four? Because I changed, the, I do a, like uh, John mentioned, I can, I have a parameter. I, so oh, it's, okay. I have alpha. I have alpha. It's a kind of combination. Um, so I change the alpha. When alpha equal to one, you get maximum benefit. Alpha equal to zero, then you have the maximum equity, right? So what I'm saying is, maximum equity is I get no toll scenario. This is maximum efficiency at policy one. In between, this alpha varies from one zero to one. Okay. So now I look at distribution effect. The policy one is really Regressive. So the low income people suffer the most, high income people suffer the least. Why they all suffer? Because they transfer a lot of revenue to government. This is a, you want to maximize, this is the efficiency, max, efficiency maximizing, okay? Maximization. And when you put more weight on equity, so policy four and becomes Pretty improving. Everybody better off. The low income people better, better off the benefit the most than the high income people. So low income people, high income people better, better off than the middle income people. Why? The low income people benefit from transit subsidy. A low income individual tend to take transit. We put a lot of subsidy on transit, the benefit from transit subsidy. The high income people benefit from reduction in driving time because we reduce congestion, the value of the driving time. So that's how you get Pareto improving. But even Pareto improving, everybody better off, the equity measure is not, is still, it's still, um, the equity measure, this is the policy of four, you still made that um, the income-based equity worse. You think, is, is there a constraint that the uh, total subsidy is yes. uh, less than the tolls generated? Yes, yes, yes. The, the net revenue should be positive. Yes. You collect money from highway char tolling, you subsidize transit, and the net benefit, net revenue should be positive. Yes. The, the transit subsidies are reflected as like path based. A link based. Yeah, it's link based. Uh, each, each transit line. So this is a. Transit subsidy, this is highway toning. It's very fun link to link. You could have multiple different Lorentz curves with the same Gini coefficient. So I'm wondering if this, if this gain that you see for the low income, does that mean that they're closer to the diagonal along that segment and then also? No, the way I would have two groups, right? I only have two groups. Oh, <laughs> so I have two groups, you can, that's the result you, 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 can, you can see. And that's how you compute it. If you have a lot of groups, then you, I, since I asked this before, right, so, so about this, how can it be not regressive? So this red thing is going up, is that solely due to the fact that you reinvest the money gained into transit? Without that, it would still go up, right? For pricing, yes, maybe. Right. So, so, so therefore, the point is the reason that you make it become more equitable is not rooted in the congestion pricing. It's just rooted in the fact that you invest more money into public transport, right? It, it, yeah, it's, it's a, once again, like... So congestion like, pricing itself cannot reasonably mate. 
more equitable is just if you use that money and combine it, right, invest it in yes. private principles, yes. then yes. you can sell it together. In because, so essentially revenue so recycling. So it's a Trojan horse. Yeah, re revenue recycling. Okay. I mean, you still get benefit to the car drivers too because right. there's less congestion. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, yes, but that is still regressive. This, if you max my efficiency, that's yeah, still regressive. Under okay. all circumstances, the congestion pricing itself has a regressive effect. Right, it's really, congestion pricing really is about, because you collect revenue, yeah. and depending on how you redistribute the revenue. Right, exactly. You that, can, that's what can make it equitable. That, yeah, I, can, I will show you later on the cap and trade, okay? But, yeah. The cap and trade actually has a better equity performance, right. exactly right. because I have a mechanism to transfer right. income from high income people to low income people. Good. Yeah, I was wondering what your thoughts were for like the New York City case, where the yeah. jurisdictions are different, right? So like you have New York and New Jersey on one side, and like New Jersey like giving yeah. lawsuits on, on this case. Yes, so. yes, that's a great point. Um, so that's mentioned, as I mentioned, income-based equity, when I group people, I only group with back to income. But if you like to consider spatial equity, then you can group people by income by where they live. Then we can have that discussion because we actually had it because we already had all the Benefit, right? We know the distribution of the benefit. It's just the way you do an, an analysis. It's just different way of group people, and you can do the, you can you can you can do the discussion. You can do the analysis and facilitate discussions. So so I know the argument of the the, um, the New Jersey people feel that okay they're being discriminated by congestion pricing, right? Right, because yeah, they're redistributing the, the revenues to like MTA. But Correct. The, but, the, but not the, the not thing. yes yes. So, yeah, if you want to have this type of discussion, this framework can accommodate that because I simply group them by where they live, by region. And then you can, you can do all the analysis to facilitate the discussion. Because we capture spatial, we capture income, we capture. Okay, so then um, I mentioned that this essentially summarized, I, I said, when efficiency is maximized, uh, low income people suffer the most, the social welfare maximizing scheme is regressive. Um, and when you give equity enough weight, low-income people and high-income people benefit more than uh, the mid-income people. Um, the better equity achieved by heavier subsidy. Um, and also said, Pareto improvement is possible when you try to improve efficiency, but the equity measures still become worse. And then lastly, it seems like for this particular example, um, improving social welfare will inevitably worsen the income-based equity. So now, if you want to improve both social welfare and equity simultaneously, you may have to look at the price differentiation. You charge different price with respect to income. It's possible. I don't know. But you also have to, you may have to move, look beyond congestion pricing. That's why we discuss a cap and trade idea, uh, trade mobility credit. Um, so the different version, and one version is the government distribute this benefit, this credit for free, and then you traveler going to require you're going to charge the credit for traveler to uh, use access facilities, and then if the government, if the user do not use up the credit, they can go to the market to sell the credit. The market was created by the government, but government do not intervene with the trading. Okay. Um, so if you do not have a credit, you want to travel, you go to the market to purchase from other travelers. And the price of the credit is determined through free trading. Um, and then, so by deciding the initial allocation and how to charge, the government can actually achieve its policy goal. Uh, for example, give you one example. For this simple network, one OD pair, the elastic demand, Given all the supply side information, if you estimate it, the VMT will be more than 1,800. So now let's assume that the government wants to reduce the VMT to be less than 1,000. What they're going to do is I only distribute 1,000 credit. I charge one mile, one credit. And then the outcome under the idealized situation, for example, no transaction cost. If I have one credit, I definitely go to the market to sell the credit. I don't, I don't, okay, so no transaction cost for this, for this type of thing. Then the VMT for this network would be only 1,000 because I only, I cap at 1,000, I issue 1,000. 
Um, the original is 1800, so therefore, the demand for this credit, and then the price will be 1.5. Okay, so how we estimate the price? You look at the equilibrium condition of the network and the market. Okay, so this is the equilibrium condition. The idea is um, for, the, um, for each OD pair, for each path, your travel time plus the credit price. There's for each distance, for each mile, you charge one credit. This is the unit price for the credit. So this is the total cost of using that path. If the path is utilized, then the, the cost will be equal to the equilibrium cost specified by this inverse demand functions. Um, if the path is not utilized, the cost should be higher than that equilibrium cost. This is about the market the credit market equilibrium conditions. When the market is clear, and the price will be positive, and when there's no av no, um, there's available credit on the market, the price will be equal to zero. Okay, there's the market uh, condition. So um, you really have to solve this nonlinear equation to estimate the price, um, but it can solve an equivalent mathematical program, which is very similar to the uh, traditional, um, the Bickman, McGuire, Winston formulation with additional constraint. So the Lagrangian multiplier of this constraint will be the credit price. Okay, so that's how we estimate the price is 1.5. But you can also implement congestion pricing. You can implement VMT fee to achieve this objective. How much you charge? You charge 1.5. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between treatable credit and congestion pricing. Okay, you can verify that by solving this congestion pricing counterpart, and this is going to be the price. Given the price, the result is exactly the same. One is primal, the other one is dual. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence between treatable credit and congestion pricing in terms of efficiency. Another idea: if you have, a, you want to control how many vehicles entering the central business district. If you estimate it, original demand is 68. If you control 50, you, so that your control objective is I only allow 50 vehicle entering, the treatable credit will be, you allocate 50 credit to the traveler, you charge one credit for each entering vehicles. If you do that, the outcome will be only 50 vehicle entering this CBD. The price will be 6.5. You can do quarter pricing, that essentially New York City will be doing. How much you charge? You charge 6.055. 6 okay? So the credit price, essentially the congestion price that you're gonna implement. So what I'm trying to say is, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between pricing and treatable credit in terms of managing the efficiency, but why we bother to consider treatable credit is because equity, okay? Why does equity, why the, the benefit of treatable credit is because there's no wealth, no money transfer from the user to the government. So therefore, you can achieve the control goal with the called the minimum loss to the users. That's the first one. Second one is because I distribute the credit. I can control how I distribute the credit, how I charge the credit, and to achieve better equity performance. And also, because the market allowed the low-income people to save the credit and sell this credit to the high-income individuals. So that's facilitate a, a more a fair distribution of the benefit from congestion reductions. Okay, so they can, the low-income people can be compensated by the high-income people through selling them the treatable credit, the credit. Then in this uh, scenario, you can't invest in public transit. Is that correct? Good. You cannot. Good. You cannot. You have to charge it positive. I'll show you later. But interestingly, I can achieve a lot of things, even I charge. I can tell you why. Okay, very good point. Okay. <laughs> because the equity, you, you have an efficiency, similar efficiency, but you have a better equity. So therefore, we feel that it's more amenable to public uh, acceptance. So now let's look at the performance. So we apply the treatable credit to the same network. I will optimize the, uh, for distribution, I do uniform distribution. 
uh, among the traveler of the same origin, but the, the how I distribute vary from origin to origin. I will charge freeway and transit. Both of them have to be positive. I charge them. Um, I optimize the charge. The charge vary from link to link. Okay? So this is the outcome. This is shadable credit. This is congestion pricing. In terms of efficiency, you see that? If I maximize efficiency, they achieve the same level of efficiency. But treatable credit has much better equity performance. And for those four policy, you actually can improve the social welfare and equity simultaneously. If you look at the distributional impact, so this is the most efficient scheme. Everybody better off? Okay, there's no money transfer from user to the government. And if you put more weight on equity, the scheme become progressive. Okay, become progressive. The low income people benefit more than the high income people. If you go to extreme, if you really want to maximize in income based equity, you can make the high income people worse off. Okay, like a Robin Hood scheme. You, how, you can, how you achieve that? You actually can, you charge more on highway and transit. You charge more credit. If you charge more credit, that increase the demand of the credit on the market. They're gonna raise up the market price. And then many travelers decide not to travel. Low income people do not, should not travel. They sell the credit to the high income people. That's essentially what this is what's happening here. So you can actually, the high income people value their travel so much, they still decide to travel and they pay more to travel. Yes. So in this case, let's say I'm a low income person who wants to travel from A to B. And you now, still, yeah. but I can't travel because it's so expensive, but I make a bunch of money by selling my credits, but I still can't go to my job. So you have some very necessity travel you have to do, right? You do it anyway. And then for the, some of the recreational travel, you just stop them. And you can save a lot of credit. You sell them to the uh, high income individuals. This is how you can make money. But do I accrue enough credits to go to work every day? You don't have to. If, if I really charge high, <laughs> it really depends on. So I, if you look at results, um, maybe you can actually make a living through that. <laughs> but a really extreme case. OK? Really extreme case. Remember, I distribute the credit. Right? And then I charge them, I, I design a scheme and charge them such that I raise up the price. Essentially, I, I distribute the money to you. It's a way of distributing money. But I'm, I'm, I'm not necessarily saying, hey, arguing this is the way we're going to do it. I think it's too extreme. Okay? So my, I get back to you. My but argument but is. Every person has to optimize this, right? Yes. They need to understand it and they need to find out what is the best choice for me strategically. Right. That's the assumption. Is Everybody is rational. I mean, they people make play the lottery. Right? Yeah. So, I mean, people don't make rational decisions. Yes, so don't, I agree. Don't, don't optimize I agree. locally, right? I agree. So, I agree. So this is still utility maximization. Even with you random utility theory, the underlying principle is utility maximization, and people have to be rational. So if you, hey, I, so you can argue that some of the people are not rational, and then you have to consider boundary rationality in the model, right. it can be done. But also they must understand it, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, for rational, you assume... Right. Perfect information and know what's going on and make a decision accordingly. So, are there um, pathways to make that work? What's that? Are there realistic pathways to make that work? So, once again, okay, I'm not sure. It's a ran hold on. It's a random utility. I would argue that the random error term captures some of the boundary rationality, right? Or, <laughs> or information. Information, perf not, um, imperfect information, right? So they have imperfect information. We are considered, because it's a random utility, and then I have a deterministic portion, I have random error. You could argue that random error capture some of the randomness due to imperfect information. So. <laughs> yeah, can I just pick up on this idea that the people who might make a lot of money, the low income people on this one, would end up having less access to mobility and 
other opportunities. Well, they, no, they, because there's no investment in public transit here. So even though they make a lot of money, mm -hmm. they may still not be able to have a good public transit system. So I wonder if that's also accounted for here. So I can so let's really go back to um, this is about utility, right? Satisfactions. <laughs> Fundamentally, if what they care about is how wealthy they feel, how well the, 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 the wealth. And so even they don't have that access to jobs, they have a way to make a living. <coughs> Are you considering this as an improvement or not? Right? <laughs> Okay, so, so I actually think it might even be worse because so somebody like like Samitha, okay, so he has the he has he's very lucky, no, but he has he has the flexibility to choose to work, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas people who have who have to oftentimes jobs, so now like with, with sort of hybrid work, oftentimes the, the the most fortunate in our economy are the ones who can choose. I'll go in once a week, I'll go in three days a week, or I'll go in five days a week. Right, right. And so you could even do better because you could keep your job mm -hmm. and sell your credits. Whereas somebody who's you know. <laughs> Who works? You know, somebody who works a job where they physically have to be present, which might be you know a minimum wage job, right. doesn't have the freedom to, to to sell their credits. Yeah, I agree. So I wonder if like there's there's even more nuance now with with the choice of like work from home or hybrid work. Or oh yeah, yeah, if we want, you can model all of that. My point is, <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, no, I'm not promoting. You could give everybody five hundred dollars each month, no question asked, right? Unconditional yeah. base income. Right. It, that's there's a lot of opposition to this politically, right? right. But Correct. I mean, that would be the reference solution. I mean, wouldn't that solve all the problems? Right. <laughs> so I'm not promoting. Okay, here I just give you one numerical example. Okay, so I give you a tool like. Honey said, we give you a tool, well, engineer, I give you a tool. <laughs> so the key point of this tool is, I give you a way to measure the impact. I told you the distribution of the impact. Yeah. You make your decision. <laughs> yeah. I just want to uh, respond to uh, Rafael's question. Like if you are a, if you want, if you, a person who has a needs to, um, to go to work, right. you're going to get a lot of credit from, from distribution. So you can oh, use the credit to, to travel, right? And yeah. you probably will get some extra, and you will use the extra to exchange that for money. So I, I guess that will actually solve the ticket. Right. So, so uh, if you model that remote work, the choice of uh, tr the, uh, the flexibility of making um, the choice, then that part be, that can be the one, the solution. You can see that from the optimal solution. So aren't you effectively here exploiting the difference in perceived and the value of income mm -hmm. between high income and low income. Here. Right. I mean, that's that huge improvement that you see is just because some people have a, a diff, you know, their equivalent yes. income. The equivalent income, right, right. So based it's not, really on, it's not real money. It's how wealthy you feel. Yeah. This is essentially is it's about utility satisfaction, happiness. I just put a dollar amount to that utility and happiness, right? Okay, I conclude. <laughs> I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not promoting this, Robin Hood. <laughs> so if you ask me to choose, I would choose this two, this two mild scheme because this is a proto improving. This is increasing social welfare and is increasing equity, improving equity. Okay, so I will choose this four and five. Um, anyway, uh, to conclude, um, so um, the I said income-based equity concern can be largely addressed by a well-designed pricing and revenue redistribution scheme. We propose a modeling framework that you can actually um, support a lot of discussion about the equity because we give you the distribution of the impact. Um, and I believe that the, uh, typically the subsidy, subsidized transit is very important. And here we only talk about transit uh, fare adjustment. You can do a lot of transit improvement, okay? Um, increasing the frequency, adding a transit line, et cetera. Um, and I didn't talk about too much, but the price differentiation or discrimination can further improve income-based equity. I also mentioned that it can tradable credit can be a good alternative, but tradable credit has also its own issue, for example, we always assume that there's no transaction cost, but it's always market friction. So that will, because I even have some credit, I don't necessarily to trade the credit. 
Okay, so that will be less efficient than pricing counterpart, and also it's a cost extra to create a market and to regulate the market. Okay, so I want to just finish by um, talking about the first consistent pricing program in New York City. It's about to implement. Uh, according to the plan, the car will pay fifteen dollars to enter Manhattan. So how to address the income-based equity? Low-income people will get fifty percent off after you make 10 trips within a month. First 10, 10 trips, you pay $15, and then after that, you get 50% discount. And then they, are, they use all the revenue to fund improvement for city subway and bus networks. Okay, that's essentially what we discussed. And study con conclude that the program is not, may not be, will not be regressive, but this, uh, the analysis is really simple. The argument is, most of the low-income people rely on public transportation to get to work. Only 2% of them are driving. So therefore, they benefit from this improvement. But I think it would be nice that once you have that project implemented, you get all the empirical data, and you can do this type of analysis to show how, what's really the impact. It's going to be a very interesting empirical study to do. And New Jersey is suing to block this. Huh? New Jersey yeah, yeah. is suing. Yeah, they're suing because they feel that New Jersey people come to the Manhattan, they pay for the toll, but when they redistribute the toll, they only focus on improvement locally. They don't, <laughs> they don't stop to that. That's a spatial equity you talk about. Okay, spatial equity. So we can actually capture that if you want. Um, the last sentence is not invalidated. Because it only says New Yorkers in poverty. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the, the content I presented today are taken from those papers. Um, and so if you're interested, you can read them more. So um, this notion of uh, feeling richer, this only works up to a point. Because you can feel rich, and then you start spending on your credit card, and you get the bills. <laughs> and eventually, your utility of income is going to change, because such people learn. Right? It's, it's adaptive. So, uh, I mean, there's, if you do the long term evolution of this, uh -huh. probably we'll, we'll revert back to something different. Probably the utility function will evolve yeah. with respect to time. So yes. Yeah, because utility really is about satisfaction, happiness. There is an interesting twist to what you said about the watching the uh, credit card spend. When we did the evaluation of the uh, value of pricing by the Port Authority in New years, years ago, we asked the, uh, the users to report the tolls that they thought they had paid. And those that uh, it paid by electronic uh, toll collection had tremendous errors. Nobody knew exactly. They didn't remember the tolls. You see? Which is uh, interesting. Uh, I mean, they, they, they didn't have a exactly good sense about the, the price signals that were hitting them. Okay, thank you very much.